Bill, yes. thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live and what you do? Thank you, Guy. Yes, my name is Bill Wiggenhorn. I reside currently in Fort Myers, Florida. It's our 14th move over the last uh, 25 years. But it's uh, been kind of our home base. We've been in and out of here since 1971. So it's uh, a pretty nice place to work from. And uh, we also have my mother-in-law here who's 101. So she keeps us hopping <laughs> as part of the support group. And uh, it's uh, just a little bit better than Chicago was. Thank you. Ah, do you still uh, maintain a place in Chicago? No, we sold it a year ago. Ah so live out of room 326 at the Holiday Inn Express in Lake Zurich when we go back. <laughs> I and, see. Uh, yeah, and, and, and Guy, as you probably know, we're still working. We uh, own a little company with my wife called Main Captiva. And it just stands for our office was originally on Main Street in Barrington, and we wish it was on the island of Captiva. Mm -hmm. And that's the only significance. And uh, as part of my background, I spent 10 years with Xerox, 20 plus years with Motorola, and then my wife and I have owned our own business for the last 15 years. Thank you. Could you share with us where you grew up and where you went to school eventually and what you studied in college? Yeah, I grew up in southwestern Ohio. I was an Air Force brat. So uh, our home base was Wright Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, uh, which really was my introduction to kind of continuing education. Uh, I went to uh, an all boys high school, Chaminade, and then to the University of Dayton, where I also worked for the Air Force in their what they call Building 828, which was the building and the system that tracked unidentified flying objects. Now, this is back in the late 60s. It was kind of spooky. And it's the first time I ever met software engineers who were really a very, very different breed. And uh, I think it was there I really got my love for continuing education and looking for the questions that were not yet answered. And so it was a good basis. And, uh, and then also during the time of student you know, riots, revolutions during the Vietnam area, et cetera, uh, we worked with a, a group and we ran kind of an underground railroad system of uh, followed by, you know, modeled after the old slave system of moving uh, draft dodgers, I guess, to Canada and, uh, and joined an organization called Bergamo, which was set up by an Italian pizza maker <laughs> to tackle problems nobody else would. And so it was 125 people. I was a token uh, kind of teenager. Most of them were PhDs, and uh, again, it, it brought me in contact with the, uh, you know, kind of the unknown, uh, again, the new questions. So I, was, you know, even though my background was in political science, history, eventually business administration with a master's, it was really that formation at uh, Bergamo that uh, I really think shaped what I wanted to do the rest of my life. Interesting. Very interesting. So where did you go to college and get those uh, degrees? I'm sorry. Yeah, University of Dayton. Ah, thank you. So what was your first job out of college then? Uh, actually working for Bergamo as the uh, uh, public relations officer. Uh, basically, it was a job of defending us from the, uh, the communities because we were doing things very unpopular, like helping put the Ohio National Guard back together again after the Kent, uh, Kent State Massacre, of uh, dealing with um, people who didn't want to go to Vietnam, of challenging the draft system at the time, General Hershey. Uh, was head of the uh, Selective Service Board, and we went kind of after him. So it was a very interesting uh, time. We also participated in the Civil Rights Movement during that time. And, uh, you know, looking back, I mean, I could never run for political office today because all those things I'm sure would come back to haunt me. <laughs> uh-huh. So how did you get, uh, when I met you, you had recently come from Xerox, and you just said you just right. spent 10 years at Xerox. So so what what... How did you get to Xerox from that first job? Um, actually, we were hired by Xerox. The Bergamo was hired by Xerox to work with Battelle Labs. And at that time in the 70s, Battelle Labs was the largest shareholder of Xerox. And they were having problems in the sense that they had great science. They just didn't sell it to anybody. And so we were um, brought in to help them develop a strategy of how to sell their science to industry. And uh, at that time, I met the Xerox people. 
I also ended up getting married, and so now we're in debt. Uh, and so I had to get a real job. And so Xerox offered me an opportunity to join their education group, uh, which I did. And I was there about six months, and I wrote, I mean, I, I think back today, I mean, people just don't think, do these things. But I wrote a letter to the chairman of the board of Xerox telling him I thought his approach to the education market was all screwed up. There were a lot of things they could do, especially in the federal government. And lo and behold, six weeks later, I get a, a, an answer from his office, basically saying, if you think you're such a hot shot, uh, Peter recommends that you report to Washington, D.C. You'll be in charge of the uh, education market for the whole uh, publishing group. And uh, he wishes you well, and your target for your first year will arrive shortly. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got to Xerox. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. So then you ended up going to Florida, I believe, um, and working with, I, I think it's a marketing and sales group uh, within Xerox. Yeah. Is that true? So talk right. to us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I thought the industry was wonderful because our sales school was at the Sheraton Hotel on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. And we would have two hours to go sunbathing and uh, look at the beauties walking up and down the beach and uh, then come back. And I thought, oh, my God, if this is industry, this is wonderful. I should have joined many years ago. We also got to fly first class. I mean, you're now you know, 24, 25 years of age. I mean, those days are well over. Mm -hmm. uh, Xerox was such a booming company at that time. We used to shoot craps for our budget because there was no budget process. That quickly changed. But, uh, uh, you know, I was part of that sales group. And then they decided to build Leesburg. Uh, training center, which was, I think, at the time, the largest education center constructed in the U.S. It had 1,001 bedrooms, I remember that, covered hundreds of acres. And, uh, and the idea was to bring sales, young sales recruits, young service reps, and also for, uh, future branch managers uh, to there for training. And it was really, as we started to work with branch managers, I came across kind of what I would call performance-based learning. Mm -hmm. and really focusing on what people need to know to be successful, not what we thought they sh should get. And so that was my introduction. Let's see. So uh, talk, uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, you going to Motorola. And I've heard some stories that go way back. It, 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 as a matter of fact, it's been 38 years ago to this month that you hired me at MTech. So I wish to thank you for well, that. And I got to meet and work with you know, Gary Rumler and Neil Rackham and John Carlisle, and that's where I met Ray Svensson. And right. I even skip level reported to you for nine months and got to sit in on all the meetings about the governance structure that uh, Ray Svensson helped put in place. But but I so I remember some of your stories about um, Bob Gavin. One Galvin wanted to hire you and wanted to start a university, and you talked him out about uh, out of that. Talk to us a little bit about. Uh, you know, how you came to Motorola and what the uh, what the discussions were and what the goals were in terms of what you were charged to do. Yeah, well, let me go back to Xerox for a moment. My last assignment at Xerox, there were actually two. One was to be the acting head of education for Xerox because the man who was was on leave. And at that time, I met uh, Gilbert and Rumler. And really, they began to focus on, you know, make sure you know what people are supposed to do make sure that they're trained to do that. Don't train them in things that are irrelevant. I mean, we started having those discussions. And, and so I spent a lot of time with uh, Gilbert and Rumler at their facility. And you know some of the stories about Gilbert, Tom Gilbert. I mean, he was just incredible. Mm -hmm. but, my mm -hmm. but my favorite was we got caught in a snowstorm. And, you know, Gilbert always had a good pint of something nearby. And so uh, by the time we were done, he was laying flat on the conference room table, espousing the future of performance-based education. And I and a guy by the name of Bob Christian just took notes after notes after notes. And the next day when I woke up, he basically had the strategy that I sold to Bob Galvin probably 18 months later. Mm -hmm. So I go back and say that those two gentlemen, and also Neil Rackham at the time, had a tremendous impact of how I looked at basically the role of corporate education. When I interviewed at uh, Motorola, uh, Bob Galvin had two models in his mind. One was a classic uh, academic model, and he had two candidates, the dean of the uh, 
Business School from Northern Illinois University and the president of Ambrose College somewhere in the Midwest. And then I said to him, well, I think your other model is to create a service division and, and where the basically the employees are the clients, but also that your customers are clients and your suppliers are clients. And then in our discussions, we had government policymakers as clients. So I said, kind of, that's your choice. And so he said, go talk to my, my staff. Well, it was, it was a total of 21 interviews. And it really became clear that Bob was the only one who wanted this. The rest of them thought, you know, and so the support wasn't too great. But uh, he offered the job. I joined, and then the first thing he did was put our office, as you know, when you join, on Gould's campus. It wasn't on Motorola's campus. And he said, you have to prove yourself and work back to the campus. But, uh, uh, you know, but he was, he was always very supportive. But his thing was, you have to earn your right to be here. Uh, I bought into your model. Now you have to convince those other 20 people, executives, that it's the right model, that it's an investment, not an expense. And you have to, you know, basically help them see the return on that investment. So that's, that's really how it started. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I, I recall that uh, there had been no corporate training and development organization for 10 years prior to the start of MTech, if I, under, if I remember the stories correctly. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. And and being off campus was weird. It was it was strange. Yeah, right. And when people came to visit us, they thought we were something special because we had that Picasso statue right outside that's the right. front yeah. door. Yeah, that uh, story, <laughs> Picasso. <laughs> um, so, could you share with us a little bit about uh, uh, how it all then worked and played out, and and what benefits it brought to both MTech and to Motorola to bring in this performance based training and development approach. Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned they did nothing for 10 years. Prior to that, they spent a lot of money on leadership development, and they basically had a leadership college. It was located in, uh, outside of Phoenix, Arizona. And their conclusion was at the end of that investment that the only thing that happened was that their executives could go to a cocktail party and sound very intelligent. But what they were taught never got conveyed or transplanted into their behaviors as business leaders. And so that's when he just said, forget it. So now you come to where we are and we said, no, we're going to focus in on those things people need to know to perform today and to increase their performance tomorrow. And then we surround ourselves, people like Ray Swenson, Rumler, Rackham, et cetera, who helped us, as you know, kind of build the strategy and build the documentation of what was necessary. And we began to codify the key jobs. We also then hired instructional designers, such as yourself. But we codified them as engineers. And part of it was in the culture, we didn't lay off engineers, but we certainly laid off education people. <laughs> so the jobs were graded as you would engineers. And we kept saying an educational technologist is simply a people engineer. And in the engineering community, that kind of, you know, took, took root. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so then we began to move from there. We also had a vice chairman at that time by the name of Bill Weiss. He was an MIT graduate. Uh, he actually uh, grew up in Chicago and was kind of an engineer's engineer. And he wasn't too excited about this investment. But he decided to give it a chance. And so as we created some massive programs, say around Six Sigma, for instance, and also the eventual the Manufacturing uh, Institute, he actually would teach and participate. And then about, oh, six months later, he would call 10 of the students who were in the class and said, all right, this is what you learned. Tell me what you've done with it. And if they couldn't explain it, he would say, well, Bill, you wasted a lot of money. If they could... Then he would call their boss and said, did you observe this change in behavior or this change in the ability to perform a function? And so he would come back to me and say, okay, it's, it, we'll, we'll continue. This is a good investment. And so when we won, really won the ASTD award, I don't know, back in the 80s, I just remember it was Bill Weiss who flew with me to pick up the award. And his uh, message to the, the convocation was that, uh, you know, you have to see this transferability. And you don't need to do sophisticated return on investment data collection. You just have to pick up the phone, talk to people, and talk to their bosses. And by the way, if you teach yourself, 
you then become a, a model for the other learners. And so he did that really until the day he died. Excellent. Thank you. I want to ask about a couple of the people that uh, I'm familiar with and then maybe delve into some some of the folks that uh, were there after I left. But so Ray Svensson, who I joined uh, his small consulting firm back in 82, at the end of 82, he helped install what uh, I would call a governance structure. And right. um, I because I skip level reported to you for the first nine months that I was there, I sat in on the manufacturing materials and purchasing uh, advisory yeah. group. Yeah. Can you talk about the whole governance structure and, and uh, uh, you know, what that was, how that worked, and what benefits it brought um, to both MTech and to the organization? Yeah, I think, that, you know, one of the uh, very wise uh, pieces of advice that Ray gave us was that even though we were in the HR department, it was very important we be owned by the company, not by HR. And so his recommendation was, one, you form a board of directors, and on that board, you need representatives of each of the major businesses and each function. And with Bob Galvin then, who, who agreed to be a member of the board, he also then asked that the second command, remember we used to have offices of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the person who was second in command was then a member of the board. And it was that person's job to represent that business, but also to represent MTAC and then the university back to the business. We also then took one of the key uh, finance managers and put him on the board because at the end of the day, if you didn't have the support of finance, you had nobody. And so we, we kind of built that. And then you had these advisory councils or curriculum councils for each one of the functions. So you had one for the engineering council, manufacturing council, sales and marketing council, the HR council, etc. And their job was to look at the, the needs of their population to make sure a curriculum was designed to address that and to evaluate the success or lack of success of that investment. And then they would also make recommendations to the board every year about what they wanted, but also the board would take on the corporate initiatives and drive those such as you know, Six Sigma. One of the things that uh, I recall, and I hope I recall this correctly, is that the first time that there was a budget given, uh, I think the budget came down from on high and the engineering community balked at the number because they wanted two, three times what was going to be allocated to them. And they went and complained about it and they got that money. And I remember uh, the training project supervisor group that I was part of, we were all cheering on the floor because this process seemed to work because somebody said, here's the money you're going to get. And they said, that's not enough. And here's our business case for doing it and give us more. And they got it. Is that, do, yeah. I, do I remember that correctly? <laughs> no, that's correct. As a matter of fact, what we found is that if, if you were part of HR, you were always going to have budget cuts. Mm -hmm. If you were embedded within the businesses, they would find the money. And so, as a matter of fact, years later, after we built the Galvin Center, when we needed a new center in Phoenix, which became a magnificent building, all that money came from the businesses. Mm -hmm. They never asked anybody. They just said, what do you want, et cetera. And we built those all, all around the world. Uh, we also had a, a system for a while where you could not bring money back from Asia into the U.S. So it was actually deposited in Singapore for the company. And we were permitted to draw from that account without having to pay any interest or anything to support our Asian growth and expansion of the university. So, you know, again, I go back to Ray's words of wisdom. Make sure you're embedded in the business. You're not embedded in HR. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, again, at the end, you needed the right HR executive who would tolerate that. And we were very lucky. We had a guy by the name of Jim Donnelly for most of the years who just basically met with me once a year and, <laughs> and gave me some feedback, and that was it. Uh, and his thing was, you know, you really report to your board. The board's the one who'll give you your feedback. And then Bob Galvin, every, at the end of every board meeting, gave me my performance review, uh, which was a very interesting experience. Because his purpose of his review, which if you think about all these performance systems have been set up, I always felt they were a gotcha system. His was truly, here's what we're doing well. Here's what we can learn to do better. Here are the cues we missed. Here are the opportunities that they presented that we need to capitalize on. And it was always you know, done over a cup of coffee, no paper, and in a certain sense at the end of, the, end of it, no notes. 
Hmm. And I'd go back and dictate it to myself very quickly. But it was never recorded. It was the assumption is you're doing, you're the right person, you're in the right job. All we're going to keep doing is to make you better. And I just thought, boy, as a philosophy, if we could do that throughout the whole organization. I mean, you just felt good at the end of this review. I mean, matter of fact, my wife once said to me, Bill, he said you were crap. I said, he didn't say that. He said, well, I'm just telling you gently because uh, he gave me an assignment and it was, a, and this is how he would think of things. Uh, we, uh, if you were, this might have been after you were gone, but he hired a group of anthropologists. And we had those anthropologists, uh, anthropologists come in and go through all the factories, et cetera. And he said, I want them to pick through our bones to see who we are and where we might go. And then at the end, he brought the anthropologists and the executive team together for a dinner. It was in Phoenix at the, uh, I think, Four Seasons restaurant, or Risk Risk Carlton. And so prior to the dinner, he said, Bill, I want you to set the table. Well, there were more forks and glasses than I'd ever seen in my life. But he stood there and watched me. And then he said, I want you to place the people to mix it up. So I did that. And he said, you know, you're a great university president, but you really don't know how to set a table and you don't know how to place people. Let me show you. Now, this is, a, you know, a guy who's worth a couple billion dollars. And, and you know, the, I still remember the Risk Carlton staff standing there just aghast <laughs> that you know, he was doing that and we were putting the place cards there. And, uh, and then we had the dinner. And then at the end of the dinner, he said, well, now let's talk about why we had people sit where they are and uh, what, what happened in the discussion. That was really incredible. But he was down to that level of detail mm-hmm. in many ways. And yet people said, you know, he always thought about the next 50 years, but he also thought about the next 90 minutes and how to capitalize on that. So Excellent. that was really Excellent. part of his feedback. Excellent story. Let me shift here a little uh, to Neil Rackham, who mm-hmm. you had exposure to back at Xerox, and you brought him into Motorola. And can you share with us that story of him coming in? And uh, I'd like to have you talk about the experiment that was done in Canada with the control group, and then the manager, sales managers up there didn't like the control group because one group was really succeeding and the others weren't. Yeah. And then it went to, they didn't want just coaching for sales managers. They wanted training for sales people. And I think that that was not part of Neil's model, but, but can you share with us that background and, and correct me where I've misstated this? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I mean, we met Neil when I was at Xerox and he had done some work for Rank Xerox, which was a European partner. And it was during the uh, coal crisis uh, when the coal miners were on strike, et cetera, and business literally stopped in the UK at that time. And so Neil had set up a, a pilot program in which he trained a certain number of salespeople and, and, and certain behaviors, the spin model became known, and uh, it trained them versus others. Well, in, in dire times, this team sold and achieved all objectives. And so at that time, I was in charge of sales education for Xerox. I was watching this. So we brought him to the United States. And we began to try the same thing with branch managers, then with sales managers, and eventually salespeople. And it worked. And there were some things that we began to you know, discover that Neil had and spent called situation questions. If you asked more than 11 of those questions, the client thought you were stupid. And, 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 and those were the questions salespeople loved to ask. They might ask 20 or 30 of them, hmm. but they would never go from that situation question of, of back gathering to basically what's the need payoff for the customer and the close. So when I came to uh, Motorola, um, the big sales force was in the communication sector, as you might remember. A guy by the name of Art Sundry, an ex-Marine, was in charge of the... Uh, sales organization. And if you went into one of his regional sales offices and could see and went to the next 90 of them and you were blind, you would know exactly how they were set up. I mean, it was very militaristic. And he really did not believe that you needed to be trained. You just needed to know product. You needed to know how to wine and dine. And, uh, and that was it. So we were not invited to do anything in the U.S. So we went to Canada and we set up the project in Canada. And, and, and what happened there is the Canadians did very, very well while their U.S. counterparts weren't doing so well. So anyway, I thought, oh, this is great. We got all this data that says that it's work, productivity is improved, et cetera. So I come back in the U.S. I go to Art and his committee, 
And I said, look, this is just basically, it's terrific. It's, it's, it's in America, et cetera. And I never forget, they said, oh, that's Canada. They're not like us at all. Now, you know, we'd run in Toronto. I mean, it's not exactly a city totally different than Chicago. Uh, so we had to rebuild. And if it wasn't for the sales council, you know, I'm not sure we would have ever made any progress. But again, they put one of their senior dep- uh, senior people on it, Davey Bartram, who was a very creative guy. And I got another executive by the name of Ken Hessler, who were both old time com sales vice presidents. But they were people that Art would listen to. And so that's how we began to move forward there. And then we brought in our first dean of uh, the sales area. And, um, and, and she was credible in the sales organization. And then, you know, we did the same thing in engineering. We did the same thing in manufacturing, et cetera. So that became the link between us in education and education and that client group of somebody respected by the client group because they were one of them. Mm-hmm. Excellent. You assigned me to work on a negotiations course with uh, Neil's team back in Sheffield, England, for right. the Motorola sales, purchasing, and government negotiators. Right. And I got to fly to England and attend uh, some negotiations training that John Carlisle was delivering. And then I helped bring his course back into Motorola, and we conducted a, a pilot of it down in Phoenix. And it was very well received, and then others worked on it after I left. Um so can you talk us a little bit about their win-win negotiations program? Yeah, well, it, I mean, it changed the mindset of from win-lose to win-win. And so, again, it was part of the transformation to be much more client-focused, customer-focused. And, and if you really looked at comm sector, a lot of their contracts were with big, with big governments, police forces, fire departments, et cetera. And so you had to permit that organization to show the taxpayer that they won. So it was that whole mindset mm-hmm. of how to take mm-hmm. care of it. If you took Phoenix, where Semiconductor was, that training was used for internal negotiations because Semiconductor and the rest of the company used to negotiate prices, internal price transfers, for months. And I remember Gary Rumler saying, you know, once he says, you know, he said, I used to think that, that, that in corporations we had these silos. And he said, I originally thought they were grain silos where you stored wealth. And then I realized they were actually missile silos. And <laughs> you fired the missile, you know, from marketing to HR. HR fired it to engineering, et cetera. And he said, at Motorola, what you're doing is you're having semiconductor fire their missiles into automotive, comm sector, et cetera. And then the other guys fire back. So this is a complete waste of time. So, you know, we, we took that kind of win-win uh, model that you worked on and put it into internal negotiations. And I think actually an in internal negotiation it had its biggest payback because it compressed the amount of time we wasted on it. And it was also very, I mean, at the end of the day, Motorola had to win. I mean, you know, it was just crazy. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, and so again, I think that it was a program that had an impact. And again, if you were Bob Galvin, Bill Weiss, John Mitchell, et cetera, you saw those results. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned Gary Rummer, and he was, he's next on my list here of questions. And uh, from my selfish point of view here, uh, I got to work with Gary uh, half a dozen to a dozen different assignments for the group and uh, for the Manufacturing Purchasing Materials uh, organizations and uh, got to work on uh, his efforts to create the MTech uh, design process. Um, so working with him was extremely influential to my professional development, uh, for sure. And I had worked with people prior to coming to Motorola that uh, were Rumlerites and had worked with his brother, Rick. And so I got influenced by all of that early. Um, But you'd known Gary prior to Motorola. Can you share with us what you did with him prior to him coming? And then what was the story of of you bringing him in and what, what tasks did you give him? What goals did you give him? What were you trying to achieve with uh, Gary Rumler? Um, at Xerox, we brought him in. Well, we read his book, uh, he and Gilbert on human performance. And I had a boss at that time by the name of Jim Bolt, who was really one of the leaders, I think, in corporate education back in the 80s, who read the book and said to me, you know, we got to meet this guy. And so we invited him up from Princeton to uh, Stanford, Connecticut. We spent a day with him. And Jim just said, you know, if you can figure out how to use him, do it. But I think this guy's got something. 
And so we started to work. And, uh, and you know, it, I mean, I had more, I had the largest collection of stick figured people in the world <laughs> on flip charts, okay, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, he could get up and make those little people move all around and, and deliver the message of the whole human performance system and you know, the feedback loop, the reward system, all those things. And so we, we took that concept and designed it into the branch manager schools. And at Xerox at the time, the branch manager was the key. And we had three levels. And the levels were simply based upon size. So if you were the branch manager of Manhattan, you were a level three. If you're the branch manager of Rockford, Illinois, you were a one. But, but each one of them had very specific tasks that had to be done. They had the power to set up their feedback loop. They had an awful lot of power over the reward system. And they also were responsible for understanding the situation analysis within their marketplace. So at the end, we compared that new series of schools with what they had. And again, the local management who was responsible for the branch operations were very impressed. And so then they asked Gary, could we also work on an evaluation system so that we could actually take the evaluators who were a full-time staff in residence at Xerox, whose task was to evaluate the performance of all major programs we had invested in, and at that time, mostly in the service area, because that was the highest cost. But then we moved into sales and management. And Gary worked with them to set up a, a, basically a process for looking at the feedback loop at each one of those steps in the human performance system. And so we weren't just now evaluating training. We were evaluating the system itself and what modifications had to be made to the system. So he established great credibility. But he would spend days with us. And then he and Gilbert would have these weekend conferences, and we would send people there. And as I said, you know, if you had the right snowstorm, et cetera, they <laughs> ran for days. Uh, but, you know, people come back and really would understand it. When I went to, to uh, Motorola, I mean, there was nobody there. I mean, there was, uh, I think, two people. And, uh, and one of them, Ed Bales, had read Rackham's work and had also come across uh, Gary's. And so um, the first day I was there, Ed and I had lunch, and we talked about this. And then Ed, I remember saying, well, I'm sorry, Bill, I'm, I'm leaving at uh, 4 this afternoon. I'm going to Germany. I'll see you in a month. <laughs> but what I knew is that of the two people who were there, one of them actually understood both Rumler and Rackham. And so then I thought, this is a good time to invite them in. Uh, Gary helped us kind of build the model of, of of what our system would look like, as you know. And, uh, and and so, you know, I go back and say, yeah, Rackham and and uh, Gary probably had the biggest influence on the total, and, and, and Ray, I mean, the total, those three helped us really shape what the university was to become, how it was to operate, how it was to be looked at, how to talk to other people about what we do. It was another big thing that Gary contributed. He said, you know, you have to speak in the language of the receiver. He said, we will have our own language and we can talk to each other about it. But that is Greek to who we're trying to serve. So your, part of your job is to make sure you and your staff can speak their language, put our human performance system model in their language, not in, in ours. And so again, uh, you know, it, it was also, it was very lonely coming to Xerox, I mean, coming to Motorola. In a sense, there was no one who really wanted to talk to you. I mean, because most people didn't want it. You could only spend so many hours with Bob Gowan. <laughs> and, you know, and so, it, you know, you, you had no one to go to lunch with. I mean, it were very simple things because you weren't even on campus. Um, and so having a Rumbler and a Rackham and a Ray, et cetera, to really call and talk to, I, or I said they were my 800 number locked in a closet somewhere you could share things with as, the, as we began to build up our staff. And um, Ed Bales was just here a couple of weeks ago, and we were kind of going back through some of those very early years and how those people in particular helped us survive probably that probably the first five years, which were always up for grabs. I recall that you were uh, constantly traveling and bringing back messages from the field uh, and from the leadership out in the field to us and uh, helping us understand, you know, what was important, what I, I guess were the critical business issues, the CBIs that, uh, 
you wanted us yeah, to be aware of. Um, and but anyway, so th- that was my that's my recall of you. Somebody in that job here is just on the road meeting the customer, trying to understand their needs and bring back, you know, our marching orders. In other words, and uh, um, and, and the other thing I was looking for is what we could we do to help them succeed against their goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And where and where we made our I would say our biggest contribution. And if I'd never gone to the field, I would never have known this, was with the policymakers. Because if you think about it, during this time, the Berlin Wall fell. Half the world now opened to us that wasn't open. We needed to make sure that the regulators in those countries, uh, from the Eastern Bloc and then eventually China, wrote the regulations so we could play. Because if they didn't, we'd be out of the market for at least a decade. And so that became our focus. And the other thing is when we changed the name of the organization from MTech to University, which George Fisher did, not Bob Galvin, the term university was non-threatening to governments. And it was a, uh, a term that uh, they could partner with easier than a corporation, even though they knew it was Motorola Corporation. And so we used the university to create the platform for discussion with the businesses over regulations. And so that's why Motorola University has such a, especially a big impact in China. Because once a year, Motorola University and the Motorola China operations sponsored a critique session with the Chinese government in which they gave us our report card. But if you go back, Motorola was the only company that never had to have an in-house union in China was the only company that was not shut down when we bombed their embassy in Belgrade. It was the only company that basically uh, was given messages to give Bill Clinton directly, bypassing the ambassador because the government trusted Motorola more than the the, uh, formal government channels. And uh, part of it was just because we figured out how to use the university to do that. We did that to also a, a, a degree in Poland, Russia, Czech Republic, et cetera. So from all those travels, one of the benefits was seeing an opportunity and then be able to capitalize on it. The other thing is Bob Galvin had always said, part of our responsibility is to be the scouts for the organization. Go tell us what's out there and bring back your interpretation. So it wasn't just to go see what Mode Rollins wanted, go see what was out there that Mode Rollins weren't seeing and bring that back. And so a lot of our board meetings were really on observations we had, not just myself, but others, of the dynamics going on. I'll give you an example. When Nokia began to move into the cell phone market, you know, they came with multiple colors. And it became really clear that for the younger population, technology was free. It was fashion. And it was at the same time we were saying, no, you only need a black phone and you only need a battery that's black or gray. And Nokia was saying, well, what if we sell a six-pack of batteries and each one's a different color? And, you know, I remember we, we, we talk about that, we scream about that, and we lost. And Nokia won, and Motorola lost. Then years later, you know, the same thing happened to Nokia. I mean, kind of thing that's interesting. I'm now working with Nokia uh, as they try and, and give rebirth. And now we're doing immersion programs for them where we're literally going out and seeing what's there the same way we tried to do for Motorola years and years ago. But eventually, I think we all become blinded by our own success, so we don't see what's there. We see what we wish was there. But that was, I think, you know, China is a good example of where it worked, and the uh, color pack phones is a good example where it did not work. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, I want to shift to... Rumler again and talk about Six Sigma uh, at uh, the Rumler tribute that ISPI held in 2009 after Gary's uh, death. Uh, both you and Alan Ramis, R- Alan being one of my peers when I was there at okay. Motorola, um, talked about the creation of the improvement methodology Six Sigma. And as I understand it, and perhaps this is not quite right, uh, Motorola bought license to Gary's intellectual property for that. And then I remember begging Alan to write a story that that tells that, you know, Rumler 
was part of the creation of Six Sigma because many people at ISPI and involved in HPT didn't have a clue. And I wanted to kind of allow ISPI as the professional home of, of uh, Gary Rummler to kind of be associated with that. And so Alan wrote that article that was in Business Process Trends. Um, but can you talk us a little bit about the, the creation, the evolution of what became uh, Six Sigma and some of the Motorola people that were involved in that creation and Rummler's component to that? Because I know it wasn't all his, but, but can you share that story with us? Yeah, it actually started with an engineer by the name of Bill Smith. And, and Bill Smith, I mean, we were having major quality problems, and we were not able to really meet the requirements from Japan, which had set the highest standards in the world for quality performance. And Bill Smith had uh, gone back to his earlier career, which he had actually dealt with Six Sigma, which was basically a statistical process of eliminating errors and, and getting down to, an, you know, basically, I, we used to say the chef, you have complete freedom, and you may burn one cookie out of every 99,999, okay? So you're empowered to do that. And that was kind of the story told. And he walked in the office and told Bob Galvin about Six Sigma. And, you know, so he, this is a bench engineer. You know, he was probably in his early 50s at the time, but uh, no one had ever listened to him. He walked in, told Bob Galvin. He left, and Bob Galvin called Bill Weiss, the vice chairman, a couple of years, and said, there was this guy in my office. He talked about this thing. I have no idea what he's talking about, but it must be important. So let's have some more sessions. And so we did. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Michael Harry at the time, uh, who at that time was in the government electronics group. And he was starting to develop education programs teaching Six Sigma. Uh, but again, it was very statistical. It was very limited population within Motorola who would get that. Uh, but that became the foundation. And then when we were given, we, the university, was given the task then to create a Six Sigma curriculum and to have it you know, targeted for different populations, that's when we went to Gary and said, okay, this is going to have a major impact because you're, you're now going to have Six Sigma. You're going to have light manufacturing. You're going to have uh, empowerment. There was a whole series of things that started to come together. And so it's going to impact the human performance system. So let's map it out. And so I, I think that was one of the values that Bill Roy had, was it just wasn't Six Sigma quality curriculum. Thanks to Gary, it was really transferring Six Sigma as a change agent to the, the performance system within the company and how we would judge things. And then, then the next phase was Bob called together a group of CEOs from Ford, Procter & Gamble, and others, and said, let's make sure the universities know how to teach this. And each one of us adopted a university. Motorola adopted Purdue University. Uh, GM, I think, had University of Michigan. Procter & Gamble, I think, had Ohio State, et cetera. And so our goal was to go in and divide the university from a Six Sigma perspective into five units just as you would a corporation. So you had Six Sigma for athletics, Six Sigma for academics, Six Sigma for R&D, Six Sigma for uh, administration, and Six Sigma for student life. And you set up the criteria for each one. Now, I never, I always remember uh, Purdue University, which was not great in football at that time, had a, a president who was German from Germany. He really didn't like American football at all. I thought it was a complete waste. But we installed Six Sigma in the recruiting process. And all of a sudden, the team started to get better. And then the president realized for every win the team got, he got an incremental $1 million in donations from alumni. And he became an avid American football fan. <laughs> but he became avid in really as a Six Sigma. He had an assistant provost, a young, uh, at that time, uh, Chinese lady, by the name of Carolyn Wu, working for him. And Carolyn helped take Rumler's thing and translate it in the academic world. And then eventually she became dean of the business school at Notre Dame for a decade. And then went on to, uh, for another decade to be CEO of one of the largest in, uh, NGOs in the world. And is now working with Leo Burke, who you remember, from Motorola University, working for the current Pope on the energy issues with CEOs from around the world. 
and they'll be holding their next conference uh, in June in the Vatican. And uh, Leo and Carolyn are the facilitators. But they have a whole mindset. Again, if you make a change one place, you have to make sure the change goes through the entire system and we put everything in balance. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the other uh, contributions that Gary made to Motorola? There's the Manufacturing Institute, I believe, and, and but there may be others that I'm not uh, really aware of. Well, I, I mean, he made contributions to Manufacturing Institute. You're absolutely right. And that was really a critical group because that helped institutionalize Six Sigma from a practical point of view. And that was, that was a two-week institute, one of the longest Motorola ever had. I think the second thing I was really as important was he helped develop the expertise within Motorola of people like yourself and all your peers uh, to, to be savvy to what we really needed to do and how to put it in terms people can understand. I think the, the third thing is he, he was always kind of improving his thought process, and he would share that. America, when I look back, I, to me, I would divide experts into two groups. One that wrote the one book and is still repeating that book to you 20 years later. And the one who writes a book and then starts the next book immediately of their new learnings. And to me, that was Gary's wonderful contribution was that he learned with you. He didn't, you know, yell at you. And so that, I mean, so when he passed away, that to me was a one of the greatest losses, not only loss of a friend, but a loss of someone who shared his learnings. I still have a plaque that he uh, presented my wife and I at our home uh, in Lake Barrington Shores, where he would he, he visit us in almost every one of our facility homes uh, in Connecticut, three of them in uh, Illinois. So he would give us a star rating on on, on the total system of the house, etc. So. Pat was so proud because at this particular home, he gave a, gave Pat a five star. Now, you know, most people, that'd be a high risk. <laughs> but, you know, she loved him and we'd sit around with some wine. And, and so we, we to this day, we have that plaque hold, hanging in our current home in Fort Myers. Funny. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, in doing my research for this interview here, I, I came across something that I hadn't uh, heard or read about before, but... Um, Bob Gav will give you some advice about two suitcases. Can you share? You talked a little bit about that, but could you tell us that's that particular story? Yeah. He said as part of being a scout, uh, you need to have two suitcases. One filled with what we know, which we want to share in the world. And the other one should be empty. And you should fill that with what others teach us. And and so when we, again, I we spent a lot of time in China. And I'd actually lived there twice at his request for six months at a time, uh, was to convince them that we were going to learn from them. We weren't going to tell them. And, and it, it was also really clear that we knew over some time period that what we taught them would come back to haunt us. But his contention was, for the world, you needed to help China become wealthy. And you had to have their citizens, if they were ever going to democratize, which he wasn't trying to sell them a democracy, but democratize. You had to increase the education level. You had to give them the right of home ownership. And, you know, so again, if you look back, Motorola built the first condominium in China. And we sold it to the workers. And they all came in with cash. And we and I remember, you know, Bob saying, "Well, how how do you how did you save sixty six thousand U.S. dollars?" And one of the workers said, "Well, when you had nothing to spend it on for fifty years, it adds up." <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah, and, and and so you know, in that bag was how you set up a condominium association. The learnings to us was how many millions and millions of dollars had been saved by the Chinese who were wanting to to invest in something. Uh, but also when he sat down with the uh, president of China, he would, and he would sit down once a year, and uh, half of those sessions were at Motorola University. He would say to the president, as a grandfather, what was the question 
that your grandchild asked you this past year that you could not answer? And the president would always tell him something. And then Bob would say, well, this is what one of my grandchildren asked me that I couldn't answer. At the end of the, the sessions, I'd always say, why did you start the meeting that way? He said, well, as two grandfathers, we're equal. As two CEOs, we're not. He has 1.4 billion people. I have 165,000. He has hundreds of billions of dollars of budget. I have a $35 billion budget. But if I can get him to see me as a grandfather, himself as a grandfather, then we can talk as equals. And, you know, again, you, you go back to the old negotiation program, the win-win. Think about what's important to the other person. How do you equalize the situation? How do you begin to build that trust relationship? All these were, one of the things he was so gifted at was taking those kind of concepts, practicing them, and then, you know, then be willing to sit down with me or many other people and provide a debrief of what happened. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yes. All right, let's shift now to post Motorola, um, Maine Captiva. You've been doing right. that, you said, for let's 15, see, I years. On my notes, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us what the product and service offerings are uh, and then maybe discuss some of the kind of clients or the specific clients that you've had over those the course of this time? Yeah, we've focused in on three areas. Uh, the first one is looking for new applications for existing products because I became convinced, and part of it was at Motorola, that you see what you want to see, you don't see what's there. And so, you know, again, like technology, once it becomes fashion, I mean, it hurts the engineer, but the fact is it's now fashion. And you have to have new competencies to be in the fashion world as well as the technology world. So, you know, that was... That was one element. The second one was, I, I, I just really believe that if you're going to develop leaders, you have to empower them to fail. And you want to fail fast. And, but you have to learn from the failure. And so early on, we happened to have clients who were willing to play with us on uh, designing projects for cross-functional, cross-cultural teams that took people out of their safe area into an area they knew nothing about. They had a very stringent assignment, a timeline, and, and we, we would hire what I call technical coaches to help them through that process, not behavioral coaches, more content coaches. So that's the second area. The third one, which grew out of the first two, is a uh, coaching practice. And that is more in the behavioral area. And there were two elements of that. One is the upfront assessment and coaching people against whatever the assessment results were. The last one, of the latter part, which is we've just been doing the last two years, is one of my frustrations always was when a program ended, it ended. And you had a community and the community dissolved. How do you keep the community going? So four years ago, I met a young man in Barcelona uh, who was a US entrepreneur, made tons of money in New York City. I uh, decided to take a sabbatical, went to Barcelona and became fascinated of how people learn and transfer learning among peers. And so he developed a software a platform called Circles. And he said, Bill, can you try it out? And I had a client who's willing. And so at the end of the formal leadership program, we then invite the teams to continue to educate each other. And, and so we have eight 90-minute sessions. And one of us sits in to just make sure technically it goes all right, but they literally discuss their own problems or, or challenges, I would say, their own challenges and offer advice to each other. And one of the things we've observed is that then that learning process just continues. At the end of the eight sessions, they organize another eight sessions, but they do it totally by themselves. And so now you really begin to see that return on that initial investment of just bringing these communities together. So that's the third thing we've been doing. The type of clients we've had I would say are big publicly, public traded uh, clients like Dow. We worked with Dow for over 10 years. Uh, one of my favorite ones, though, is Tetra Pak, which is a privately held European company. Uh, it's about 26,000 employees, 13, 14 billion in sales, uh, owned by a family. 
And they're somewhat like Bob Galvin. They think in 50-year increments. And so we've worked with them for 12 years. And, and what's been great there is that we help them develop the 2020 strategy. We're now developing the 2030 strategy. And in the 2020, what we did was say, what are the barriers to implementing the plan each year? And then we would divide those, those barriers, those challenges into projects, assign the younger hot talent between ages of 35 and 42 to those, and then track their performance. And we know basically within 18 months, everyone is either promoted or 10% leave because they really don't fit. And now we're doing the 2030. And as part of that, the first phase is we form teams of three to four of these hypos with one of our people. And we interviewed 35 companies around the world uh, where they're placing their bets for 2030. What's their business model going to look like? What's their organizational model going to look like? How will they define work? Who will do the work? Where will work be done? And what technology do they assume will be available to the worker? And so we've now just finished that. We're now collecting, you know, assimilating all that data and uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to the company. So those are the kind of things we've done. We've, uh, we've been in the gaming business. We've worked there, which was a lot of fun. We were in the perfume business. That was another one that was interesting. Uh, and that was privately held. So again, a longer term investment. Um, we've been in the athletic uh, apparel business with Adidas. And, uh, and that was interesting because you know, everybody was under age 25. You didn't walk to a meeting, you jogged to a meeting. Their uh, corporate buildings are like a university campus. The biggest building and the, camp and the structure is a gymnasium. I mean, it's just a very, very different environment than an engineering one. The other thing is that if you remember at Motorola, they would constantly reduce the amount of space per person. Remember, I mean, the cube yeah. is smaller and smaller. <clears throat> Where in today's world, there's a tremendous amount of space per employee in these new age companies. And the employee picks where they want to work every day. And you create an environment in which people want to be there, not because they have to be there. And so that's been a lot of fun. And, but, you know, that's the role of the scout in coming back, say, to a Tetra Pak or a Dow or whoever, saying, you know, you got to really begin to look at these things. And, and what you do see, because there's such a shortage of talent, there's such a need to recruit globally for talent that corporations do make some of these changes at a much faster pace than ever before, because otherwise the best talent simply isn't going to work for them. So that's what we do. Thank you. Are you writing uh, any of this up for public consumption, or is this pretty much just for your clients? Uh... Usually, well, <clears throat> the first phase is always for the client. And then we have put together some materials that we have, uh, you know, let other people have. Uh, for instance, this report will have two versions, one for the client and then one that we do hope to to distribute to others, just saying, here are our learnings. You know, we can't say it's 100% accurate, but here's our perceptions. Uh, here's what we saw among the six Chinese companies versus the 12 European companies versus the Amazons and the Microsoft here in the U.S., uh, the Edward Jones, another very interesting company going through transformation. Uh, so, yeah, we do. We don't ever sell that. We just give it to people as part of our contribution. Is that available on your on the main Captiva website or do you need to request it? Uh, we try and put it on on the website. OK. Yeah. And uh, if you don't see it because I'm lazy or something, just send me an email <laughs> to you. But we have a, a very a bright, I keep calling her a young person. She was young when she started with us 10 years ago, but uh, she's now in her mid-30s uh, by the name of Lisa Swarbrick, and she does all the documentation, and she captures it. Uh, one of the other things we've added now, because she is very gifted, is when we do these interviews, et cetera, we actually then provide the teams a transcript of what was said, mm -hmm. because we've also found that, you know, you only learn here so much. But when I hear it and now I read it, it comes back. So that's also part of this follow-up service. So we keep all those together. One reason I think we've survived with some of these companies so long, somewhat much to my surprise, is because at the end of the day, we have the best documentation. Because they keep changing people and we're still here. 
And, um, and, and so we become the library for part of the journey they went through. And again, I think Ray in particular kind of taught me that you want to, you want to document and record these things so you begin to see the transformation. And you will repeat things. You just don't tell people you're repeating them. Mm-hmm. And that, was another, that was another good learning. Never say, oh, I did that 20 years ago. That is death. You know, just say, oh, that's great. Let's try this. But knowing that you so many years before. Excellent. Um, can we shift now and talk about, uh, I'd, I'd like to have you catch me up, if you will, on some of the people that worked at uh, MTech back in the early days. I, I'm thinking in particular of John Coney and Jeff Oberlin, and there's others who have maybe branched out and, uh, and Alan Ramis. Um, and, uh, can you, can you tell us what you know about some of these, these people and, and what they're up to? Yeah, well, John Coney uh, lives outside of Phoenix close to, I think, Fountain Hills or Scottsdale area. Uh, he has been running his own consulting group for years. He had a huge impact, I think, on ASTD as it made his transformation to where it is today. Um, a great contribution. Uh, Jeff Oberlin uh, just finished a project for me. Uh, Jeff was involved in a project with me for Saudi Telecom, which we just finished I don't know, three weeks ago. And prior to that, he was head of innovation for Amita Health System. And, and basically help set up their whole innovation process. And Amita now owns, I think, 12 hospitals in the greater Chicago area. Uh, you have um, uh, people like Bob Aaron, if you remember Bob Aaron. You know, he was a very gifted person. I mean, Bob you know, spoke, what, Japanese, Russian, Yiddish, English. Um, and, and we've had him work with, with us on a project for Adidas, in which he did a complete analysis of all their programs, where the duplication was, where the gaps were, etc. I mean, it was like it's like writing the, the new Bible. Uh, they were very impressed. So he's still kind of in the game. Um, you know, Ed Bales, as I said, was just here. He's now pretty well fully retired. Uh, Ann Dilley, if you remember Ann, we just mm-hmm. visited with her in October. She and her husband Larry uh, still do some work in the Greater Phoenix area, and uh, and then uh, I think uh, Will High is in Austin. He's retired from Dell. He's a, a great distance bicyclist right now. Uh, I mean, he's got to be 65, but he probably looks like he's 45 because he's in great shape. Um, there's probably about a, I figured at one time there were 1,500 people that worked for MU. Mm-hmm. I would say probably I have contact with about 200 of them. Um, many of our Chinese uh, peers have all gone on to huge jobs in both China and the U.S. and Europe. And I think part of it, as you think back, I mean, you, I mean, you had a billion people or so to draw from, so you got some very good people. But the second one is they were the first wave to work for Western companies. And so they really became a hot commodity. And again, Dr. Jenny Yen, I don't know if you remember her, uh, she just completed a project for us. But when she was a kid, we sent her to the uh, U.K. for her doctorate. And uh, now her son's there for his doctorate. But she left Motorola, eventually worked for HP, and is now doing project work for us under her own firm and uh, based in Beijing. So there's just you know, people like that throughout the world. One of the nice things about the social network system is that you do have an opportunity to try and track some of these people down, see what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, I would say, Guy, at least half are probably still contributing, like Debbie King Raleigh, in Australia, still doing some great work with companies there and also for her church group. I just sent her a young Brazilian there to coach from uh, Sao Paulo, and he's the son of one of my clients down there. And uh, so she's, you know, I, I know what he's going to do. He's going to fall in love in Australia and never go back to Brazil, and his father and mother will never speak to me again. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I said, Debbie, just be careful. But uh, so anyway, that network continues, and, and hopefully we're willing to share we had a reunion, and I think uh, Al was there uh, in September. And we had about 110, 120 people show up, and I would say we had uh, 10 people from China, uh, which you know is pretty good. Plus, Debbie came in from Australia. We had a couple people from Europe, so um, yeah, the old network I guess holds together. Yes, I'm sorry I missed that. I was uh, intending on attending that, but then the project work uh, kind of got in the way, but. Uh... 
And I figured I'm going to know five people to yeah, whoever right. shows no, up right. because the organization grew uh, the, the, to be very different from, from my early experiences. And so yeah. it's been kind of fun here hearing about this and catching up. Um, in 2013, ASTD, now ATD, awarded you a Lifetime Achievement Award. So congratulations on that. Uh, can you tell us uh, what that was about and, and how you got that recognition? I think you just live long enough and you get it. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I remember when they called and I said, you know, we're going to give you this award and it was for the following things. And, and early on, I'd spent a lot of time with ASTD. I had chaired their public policy group for years and years and uh, was on their board of governors at one time. So I think it was part of that. But what was funny is I we go to the ceremony and I would say I knew maybe 10% of the people there. Two is at the end, some person came up and congratulated me for the award given to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, thank you very much, but I'm not that person. And they said, well, your gray hair looks just like his. I said, well, I guess <laughs> that was it. So, um, yeah, it was nice to be recognized as one of those things that uh, – at different phase of your career, that recognition is, is good. Um, but I think what's more important, at least in my mind, is to be hired by people to deal with today rather than too much reflection of yesterday. You know, I think what you're doing is building this library of kind of stories because stories are so powerful. And you, you to me, you go back and look and think through the stories not of how great the past was, but what you can take from those stories moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I told you this, my favorite cartoon in the world as I've gotten older was in the New Yorker. And there's two dogs sitting at a computer. And the one dog says to the other, isn't it great? They don't know we're dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and so I do so much work, you know, just voice. And as a matter of fact, I, I know for a fact I'm working with four 26-year-olds in Orange County, California, who developed some terrific education product. And we just had voice until last week. And I flipped on the camera. And I could just see them kind of freeze. I mean, it's like, oh, my God, we're talking to Moses. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, once they kind of got over it, I said, well, it just shows you that you don't have to be young to understand this technology. That uh, the you thought my, my suggestions and applications were pretty good. I hope the fact you've seen the gray hair now doesn't change that. And they were very nice. It was like, well, this is, I said, you really changed our whole mindset on things. And, and to me, that's what's important is in moving that forward rather than, you know, just the recognition you get for the past, which is very nice. But it's more to be recognized for can you still contribute. And I remember the when we brought those anthropologists together, one of them said, you know, it, it, and it, at that time, a couple of them were in their 80s, but they were still practicing, still writing books, etc. And one of them just said, it's just, if we didn't show up every day with something to do, then we would never show up again. And and I live in a community where we're in transition, uh, families are moving in, other people are either dead, moving out, or what have you. But those are still vibrant. 70, 80, one guy 90 years old, still run their own companies. Mm -hmm. Another guy runs railroads, another guy makes railroad tiles, another guy has a chemical plant, a uh, guy we had breakfast with this morning who's building a 210-foot catamaran powered by solar systems, an MIT guy. Uh, you know, that's exciting to me to learn from people like that, and uh, age has no barrier on them. And look at you. I mean, you're a young kid yet, but, you know, You'll still be uh, contributing for another 20, 30 years. Well, I'm 66 now, but uh, but going back to your hair, your hair was that color in 1981. Uh, well, I know. Or I, close I, to it. No, you're absolutely right. I looked back. I said, you know, when you're born old looking, then when you are old, it's not much different. And so, yeah, and I've had this white hair, which I contribute to my son uh, forever because uh, I had black hair and then he was born and it turned white. And it's been that, but at least I have it. You know? <laughs> exactly. There's a, there's a stage down here where a lot of people just don't have it. <laughs> exactly. 
Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, you received the McKinsey Award for the best article in Harvard Business Review when training becomes an education back in 1990. Can you give us a quick uh, synopsis of, of that article? Yeah, it was, uh, first of all, it was, a, it was an interesting opportunity where uh, at that time there was a lot being written about Motorola University and the fact that a corporation used the term university. And also in the UK, we weren't allowed to use the term university. But Maggie Thatcher thought it was such a cool thing, she actually changed the regs for us, which very few people know. So we were the only corporate entity in the UK that could use that term back in, in, in part of the 80s. So that just piqued the interest of the Harvard Business Review editorial staff. And they came out and visited with us and said, we'd like to do an article. And, and you know, basically, you know, the theme was, it's a university without cheerleaders. And, and so it was really built around how a university helps drive change in a company, keeps the company relevant to what's going on in the world, and why it's a good investment. So, I mean, it, it took many more pages than that, but that was a process. And how they wrote the article was we would go to Boston, sit in their offices, and they would do like you are doing now, ask a series of questions and copy and then give it back to us, and we would edit and keep going through it. But at the end of the day, I think they were surprised, too, it won the McKinsey Award because it was so non-Harvard type of material, but it had a big impact. Uh, we also wrote an article, which is now 20 years ago, on uh, the corporate university with uh, two faculty members from the University of Indiana. And I'm always surprised. I mean, every week, one to two dozen people reference that particular article. Uh, and again, instead of you know multiple page article, it was more like a four page. But I guess, and, and I had forgotten all about these. I had never gone back and read them. So I went back to read them and said, oh, you know, that content, or those, the thoughts are still pretty valid. And so now I can begin to see why people in their master's programs, et cetera, begin to go back after that. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the last thing from the Harvard thing, which, you know, came to be regrettably true, was can you sustain a corporate university over an extended period of time? And in Motorola's case, you know, regrettably, the answer became no. Um, because if you didn't have the leadership at the top, you, you can't. Mm -hmm. um, and as you probably know, they've now destroyed the Motorola University headquarters. I have one of two bricks from that building that were saved. Uh, Ed Bales has one. I have one. And it's a, it's a humble remembrance <laughs> of uh, you can build something, but it can be taken down a lot faster than you can build it up. So true. So true. For some of the research I did, I found that uh, you uh, participate on uh, many boards. Uh, you've been on the ASDD Council of Governors. You've been the chairman of the board of directors of the Educational Testing Services, the Emory University Business School Advisory Board, University of Tennessee Business School, Villanova University Engineering School Board, Institute for Work and the Economy at Northern Illinois University, the Center for Creative Leadership Board of Governors, the Rochester Institute of Technology President's Council, the USA National Commission on Education and the Economy, and the Board of Directors of Smarter Solutions, an educational company focused on improving quality in the work environment. Is there anything new to add to this list? I'm not sure how old it was when I uh, captured it. Yeah, well, that goes back a well, while, but the, the um, two boards I'm currently involved in is one, the Leadership Academy for the Saudi Telecom Organization, which is uh, um, basically a corporate university that has two charters. One is to address the needs of the telecom employees, but the other one is to help the government install the implement the 2030 plan. And if we can believe what's written, it will begin to provide more equal opportunity for women, et cetera. I mean, it has a lot of good things. You know, political environment there is such that you have to question that. But anyway participate in that board. And then the second one is a startup, which I've learned a lot from, called Intelligent Solutions. And it's uh, a result of a person we had coached for a number of years, who one day we said to him, you know, you're, you just don't fit in a big company. Why don't you create your own company? Well, much to my surprise, he did. It's called Intelligent Locations. And it uh, basically provides, uh, use uh, software, 
with an RF device to track medical equipment in a hospital. And it turns out about 15% of the medical equipment in a hospital that's not bolted down disappears every year. Hmm. And these include like pain pumps that are $5,000 a piece. So um, we have worked with him uh, on his board to install it. It's taught me a lot about uh, venture capitalists, evil people. <laughs> <laughs> Not people. Necessary. Uh, and how difficult getting a new markets is and how difficult it is to build an organization. Uh, and, and But also how times have changed. So that we have a small staff in Chicago. We have our software engineers in Argentina and our hardware engineers in Romania. And uh, with that workforce, which is world class, we can provide product at reasonable costs and, uh, you know, have a big impact. So those are the kind of the, the two current boards that I sit on. That, you know, one's kind of global. The other one is the startup community, a new age company, which is a great way to learn. Yes. Speaking of learning, as a lifelong learner, uh, do you have a particular current focus and what kinds of resources are you using in pursuit of uh, new learnings? Yeah, I subscribe to about 12 online newsletters, which come out daily. So I review those. And some of them are in the defense industry because they very much there cover uh, technology, special artificial intelligence, et cetera. Uh, I subscribe to marketing and newsletters, uh, basically online marketing, uh, such as Gartner Associates, as well as you know education companies like Torrance Learning, the uh, ATD Press, those type of things. And then I pick certain universities. So I have a university in Australia, Stanford University, Chicago, Northwestern, Harvard, MIT, who have newsletters that I subscribe to and read those. So I try and do that every day. So I start my day, I quickly review those. Then I select the articles that I've read that I think will be beneficial to my clients. So I just send them a note, something I think you should read. So for instance, the other day I came across one that was a new um, uh, technology that ANA uh, Airline is, is using, which is totally outside the airline industry. And it's, it's basically a, 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 a advanced robot for the service industry. So I, Airbus has been a customer. So I sent to Airbus. They immediately responded back and said, it's one of our clients. We didn't even know this. Uh, we want to invite them into our innovation lab. So we do that. And then uh, I subscribe to all kind of TED conferences. So I have those that are suggested to me, review those. The thing I probably don't do much anymore is read in-depth books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, occasionally, but not not much. A lot of it is these newsletters, these TED conferences, uh, blogs, and then webinars. So I sign up for probably two or three webinars a month. Uh, And then I also have my full-time staff. There are seven of us participate, and then we debrief each other. One of the things I learned from Amazon that was interesting was that uh, Jeff uh, selects one book every month for his executive staff. They have to read the book, and then they sit one evening, and you have to lead the book discussion. And it can have nothing to do with business at all. But part of the challenge is, uh, what did you learn from that? What can we learn from that, and how can we use it? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my mental model with all this stuff. Very cool. Shifting again, uh, do you have an elevator speech about what you or, or Maine Captiva does that, that you could share with us? Yeah, when somebody asked me, what do you do? I said, what we do is focus out on the questions that you want answered in which the answer is not known. And our goal was to help you tackle that. And we do so through leadership development. Uh, kind of new applications of what you do and coaching your people to fill in their gaps. Very good. Thank you. Is there an HPT or performance term or some other term or phrase that you'd like to define for us, perhaps in all your readings and exposure to these kinds of things, you find that its current use is problematic and and you'd like to put your own spin on it. Do you have such a term or phrase? Well, I guess I, I go back to the old stick figures of Gary Rumler. I keep thinking of you know, basically the flow of the human performance system. And so to me, each every environment is a system. And understanding the performance expected 
and what either supports that performance or detracts from it is so important. One of the things that came out in this study we've done of the 35 companies is companies are really wrestling with this whole balance in their system of empowering people to make decisions so they can be done quickly versus consensus building, which tends to take a long time, but execution can be faster. Uh, this whole uh, being able to have a, a, an environment in which you can fail, but you learn from the failure uh, so you don't fail the second time in the same area. But we basically condition people not to fail, which also means we've conditioned people not to take chances. And, and so, again, you know, to me, the human performance system is you have to set the system up to drive the performance you really want. You can't tell people to be innovative and then create a system where failure is not tolerated. You cannot create a system in which you say, I want to empower you, but at the end of the day, all decisions go upward. I mean, so that's, that's my mental model. So it's not so much a term. It's just that picture of the stick people in the boxes mm -hmm. that Gary mm -hmm. Glassley, you know would put up there. I, I just think I keep, uh, keep it in front of my mind every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bill, you've worked with many renowned people over the decades. Uh, you've shared stories with us uh, throughout this interview. Is there anybody else that uh, you can think of here at near the end as we begin to wrap up um, that you might share a story with us that's uh, either humorous or uh, serious and uh, had some impact on you? Yeah, a, a person we've dealt with for the last five years is a Harvard professor by the name of Mazarin Banaji. Mazarin is a, a PhD education expert, uh, comes out of... Uh, Bangalore, India, is Farsi by ethnic background. So she's not really Indian. She uh, went to Ohio State University, got her PhD, and is only taught at Yale and Harvard. Her research is all around uh, unconscious biases good people have. And, 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 and this relates to when we say, what are the applications for your products or services you don't see? Because it's our bias. It's really our bias or a bias in who we select to work with us. I mean, it's an unconscious bias. And so her research has had kind of a, well, it definitely had an impact on, on me and my staff, but also on my clients. So one of the things we do is run sessions now before we send people out with these new projects to help them identify their biases. You're never going to change the bias, but at least you're aware of them. The other thing is you want to form teams with multiple biases. Because we all have the same bias, then it really will block us. If we have multiple biases, then we have that internal challenge. So she, in particular, has had a, a big impact on, on us, very similar to what Gary did 20, 25 years ago. So uh, she's the, the current one that every time we get together with her, we learn something new. Uh, she never presents the same thing twice. And she can also... Um, uh, her, her examples are so powerful that makes you very conscious of your own biases. And uh, so sh she's one. I would say there are also some uh, business leaders that are really been impactful. Uh, the current one is the CEO of Juniper Networks, who I think is Lebanese by ethnic background, uh, a very humble guy, extremely articulate, and when he speaks to you, he tells stories. And, and you, you can follow the story, and at the end of the story, you realize he's just described a strategy to you. Another one is the current CEO of Microsoft. And um, again, he's a great storyteller. He has changed them from a, uh, a culture of we know everything, you know nothing, to a culture of we must learn everything because you know so much. Big impact. And, then, and he is, uh, again, of, I think, uh, of Pakistani background, any background. And then the third one is the CEO of uh, Medtronics, uh, who, again, has created an environment of saying, you know, we know how to design medical devices for the rich. We now need to design it for the poor. And he has created a whole environment, including an innovation center that literally brings you into the villages in Kenya of a clinic. So you're standing in line for your medical services. 
And again, I think he is Pakistani by ethnic background. And he just has changed that culture. So those are kind of my current three heroes uh, that seem to have uh, not become these uh, egomaniacs who uh, are turning their businesses around. They're all very profitable, but at the same time, they're adding a lot to society. And people are so excited to work there. And, uh, and that's why I so enjoy taking people there to see that life can be great. Uh, the other one is uh, some of the WeWork communities around the world. We, we use their offices for different meetings, but we also visit and interview startup companies. And, and, and again, that always gives me great hope because you see these people with great visions of what could happen, what is happening. Now they're, you know, identifying their life goals and, and you know, probably still living in their cars because of that. So those are kind of the new heroes. We try and incorporate many of these people into our programs so that when we put a faculty team together, a third are practitioners, a third are academics, and a third are usually uh, recent retirees who you want to debrief before they kind of lose that relevance. Excellent. Thank you. I want to modify the uh, final question here that I had, and I, I shared that final question with you right. earlier, but I'm, I'm modifying it here. So I'm looking for words of wisdom or guidance that you might give. And I've instead of just new people, I want to ask, uh, in turn, what advice might you give to new people entering the field of training and development and performance improvement? What advice would you give to experienced practitioners and third, what advice would you give to the leaders of those kinds of people? So, new people. Okay. Yeah, let's talk new people. Um, I had a grandfather who was a real entrepreneur. I think possibly he would have been serving time today. He was such an entrepreneur, but back in the early 1900s, not a big deal. But when I was very young, he said to me, decide what you want to do and then figure out how to have someone pay you to do that. Because he said, at that point, it's not work, it's life. And I, and I say to really the new people in the field, really decide that if this is what you want to do, then become the best at it and then find the culture that supports that and become part of it. Don't get a job where you're fighting day to day for something you believe in that they're just not going to accept. It's not worth your time. So that's one. The second one, which is both for people and the profession as well as the new one is make sure you have an external network that you can communicate with on an ongoing basis. Don't get locked into one company. Never let a company tell you you cannot speak with people outside. That is death. You will never then know what your opportunities are. So join small networks, work those networks, learn from the network. You know, I think also from for the those of us who've been in this business for a long time, it's important to bring new people into your organization who have the most recent education, the recent use of, of technology, and really to learn from them. But at the same time, help them take what they know and put it, again, as I say, in the language of your client base. Because, again, I've found that sometimes we scare the client. We used to scare them with human performance. We now scare them with the technology plus human performance, and they really don't understand it. So just, you know, help. We can help them translate that, but they need to help us understand what's what's new, what works, what doesn't work. Um, and and the, the last item is I think you, your network must be global. And thanks to the technology like our Zoom technology or Skype, that there's no reason why you can't. I participated in a, a program as an observer, which is worldwide, and it's just on immunization of children against malaria, measles, etc., in developing countries. Every week, several people present their challenge, and their peers around the world, who they have never met and never will meet, provide, it, provide advice. This is funded by the Gates Foundation. But it's peer coaching, peer learning, a thousand people a week. Now, again, this has helped me create, expand my network. But the other thing I say to those of us who've been in the field, join such networks. Learn from those networks. 
because again, they're using technology, you know, it goes in the Sudan, Nigeria, Kenya, et cetera, that works. And, and, and the other thing is they don't have a lot of money, so they tend to be very creative. So again, that's something I think we can bring back to our own existing organizations. You know, and the final is, you know, I think this is just a wonderful profession. It's fun, it's enriching. You're always dealing with the next generation of questions. You're always meeting the new people coming through the system. Uh, so don't give it up. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for doing this uh, video interview with me over Skype. I, I hope that our paths cross more often in the future than they have in the, for the past 30-odd uh, years. <laughs> right. But now that we have social media and we're connected on Facebook, et cetera, uh, uh, perhaps uh, we'll get a chance to uh, interact again sometime in the future. Uh, thank you for this again, and have a great day. Well, thank you. Good luck in your upcoming surgery, and give me a ring as soon as you're back. <laughs> I'll do that. Thanks. Thanks, guys.